One side, two sides. Which one's wrong? You may win, but not for long. I may escape your firebombs, but this mess that we've made, it's a marathon. No one wins a civil war, no matter what they're fighting for. So I'll pick my side, and you'll pick yours. But no one, no one wins a civil war. 620,000 American lives, or 2% of the population at the time, were lost in our country's civil war from April, to April 12th, 1861 through April 9th, 1865. Which, mind you, up until the Vietnam War, was the bloodiest war, more bloody than World War I, World War II, Korean War, and the Vietnam War combined. Combined, 623,000 lives were lost. Let's just put that in perspective proportionately as if that happened today. Could you imagine if 2% of our population today was lost at war, that would be on the upwards of 6 million people. Just imagine that for me for a moment. 6 million people, 6 million husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, aunts, uncles, sisters, brothers, nieces, nephews, cousins, neighbors, and friends. Six million people. You know, I'm standing here before you this evening because I genuinely fear that we are moving in an extremely dangerous direction as a nation. Anybody with me on that one? Yeah. Dare I say we're almost as divided today as we were in 1861. It's just the division today is amplified and worsened because of instant nature social media, the advent of the 24-hour news cycle that profits off of our collective pain. And above all else, a toxic and radical hatred, a visceral hatred that has infected the duopoly of power that is what we have come to know today as the Democratic and Republican Party machines. Now, before I go any further, please know I'm not standing before you to bash Democrats or Republicans or anyone that identifies as such. Rather, I'm here to ask all of you tonight to meet me in the middle, just for a moment to shift our focus to the importance of separating the human beings and the organizations from their behavior. Separate them. And furthermore, to discuss them objectively. Not to define a person or a particular organization as bad or good, but instead to just take a beat. Take a deep breath in. Take a deep breath in with me, guys. And let's look just a little bit more closely at our words, our behaviors, and the systems by which we are actively choosing to engage ourselves in. And as we engage our surroundings with this new lens, it's important to ask two simple questions. One, is it healthy? Two, is it serving the greatest good of the people? The people. We're going to explore this topic a little bit more in detail, but I first want to outline three important issues that I feel that we need to pay attention to moving forward in our United States. Number one. Acknowledging the vicious cycle of pain and trauma that is causing some real serious mental health crises across our country. 
Number two, the dangerously large gap that is growing between the ideologies of the Democratic and Republican parties. And number three, the increased influence of money and large corporate entities on elections and elected officials by way of lobbyists and other mechanisms. Three very important topics that I think we need to look at tonight. And I will tell you, by addressing these three issues, first and foremost, I believe that we will be better equipped as a people to handle just about any other issue that might present itself to us. If we can handle that, we can handle anything. Even the toughest age-old moral and political divides that we have experienced for years, like the Second Amendment, abortion, religious freedom, LGBT rights, and so many more. Why do I think that it's not only possible but probable to have these conversations and to move beyond this toxic environment? It's because we are going to choose to start reminding ourselves in the coming months and the coming years that although we may not always agree and see eye to eye, we're still one big happy and on more than one occasion kind of dysfunctional family. And as long as we know we're always arguing from the same side, that we're always on the same team, with a trust and confidence in the understanding that the United, in United States, actually carries the meaning of which is found in the Oxford English Dictionary. Does anyone know the meaning of United? United means join together politically for a common purpose or by common feelings. I know I've already thrown a lot at you, but I'm confident that you are very smart and that you're with me. So I wanna dive just a little bit deeper. Firstly, acknowledging the vicious cycle of pain and trauma that is causing serious mental health across our country. Lady Gaga just mentioned it at the Grammys just the other night. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, nearly one in five adults in the United States is living currently with a mental illness. That's 44.7 million people alone in 2016. Major depression is one of the most common mental disorders in our country. Major depression can result in severe impairments and interfere and limit with our ability to carry out major and even minor simple day-to-day -day tasks in our lives. In 2016, 16.2 million adults and 3.1 million adolescents aged 12 to 17 in the United States had at least one depressive episode. I can't even begin to imagine what that number is now given the current political climate. Moving on to suicide. Suicide is another major public health concern and it's one of the leading causes of death in the United States. Based on nationwide surveys, suicide in some populations is even on the rise today. According to the CDC, suicide was the 10th leading cause in our country of death, claiming the lives of nearly 45,000 people. Suicide was the second leading cause of death amongst individuals between the ages of 10 and 34. Ten-year-olds! Ten-year-olds are taking their own life. Just recently I read on Facebook, and I don't know if you guys saw this, but like a 12-year-old was bullied on the bus, and he went home and he took his own life. His mother found him dead. And the fourth leading cause of death among individuals between the ages of 35 and 54. Do you know that there was twice as many suicides as homicides in 2016? There were 44,965 suicides compared to the 19,362 homicides. We have to ask ourselves, we have to take a moment, we have to pause and we have to ask ourselves, why is this happening? Why do people feel the need to take their own life? Why, what is getting them to this dark place that they don't see the light, that they don't see their value. As I reviewed these horrifying numbers and evaluated my own personal experiences over the years being bullied, 
having doubts of my worth, and at some points, I even considered taking my home life. I've been able to reduce my numerous and complex thoughts and emotions around this to one simple sentence. Hurt people, hurt people. Think about that for a second. How many of you guys have been bullied in this crowd here? Someone said something off color to you, made you feel less than. If you're not equipped with the right tools to know that that has nothing to do with you and everything to do about with where that person is in their life and how pain they are, they're projecting their anger and their frustration out on you. You know, when I was a kid, I was severely bullied in grade school all throughout high school. I was made fun of, I was called names, I was called a faggot before I even knew what the word faggot meant. And I wasn't strong enough when I was at that point in my life to know that it had nothing to do with me. And if I knew then what I know now, what a difference that would have made. I was talking with my friend Erica on the phone before coming over here tonight, and she said, Ronnie, you know, we use the word survivor a lot when it comes to cancer, when it comes to HIV, when it comes to a lot of diseases that are plaguing our country, but we don't use this word survivor when it comes to bullying so freely. She's like, why do you think that is? <laughs> I said, well, Erica, I think you found something that actually stumped me. I don't know why that is, but you've brought up something pretty awesome, and I've never thought about it that way, and I've never given myself credit. I'm standing here in front of all you today, and I know that I'm not alone as a 36-year-old survivor of bullying because I didn't give in. I didn't give in to the negative thoughts. I didn't let that negative cycle of abuse and shame that I put myself through take me down. And, I, and we have to give ourselves credit for that. We're still here. You know, while I take great pride in the LGBT, I don't know if you know this, but I'm kind of gay. <laughs> it's true. While I take great pride in my LGBT community, I do not stand before you today as a gay man, but rather I am honestly and open-heartedly and humbly standing before you simply just as a human being. I'm a grateful son, I'm a loyal friend, and I'm a fierce advocate for what's right for all of our citizens. It's time that we take an honest look at our pain, our country's pain, our country's trauma, and our country's missteps. And, not, and this is very important. We have to take a look at our pain and our missteps, not to shame ourselves, not to put ourselves down, not to say how horrible we are, because let me tell you, we're not the first nation in the entire world that has oppressed people or enslaved people to better a certain class of people. We are not the first, we do not own the rights to that. But I've had the opportunity to dine with the richest of the rich, I've had the opportunity to go to MacArthur Park with friendly meals and serve the poorest of the poor. And you know what? We're really not all that different, you and I. We all just want to fit in. We all just want to know that we belong somewhere and that we're loved, that we matter. Our government currently lacks heart. And short of going to see the Wizard of Oz, the responsibility is ours and ours alone to figure out a way to stop numbing our feelings, to stop throwing pills, to numb the symptoms of the pain that we are told that we're not allowed to feel. I have some of my own ideas. I have spent nights lying awake in my bed thinking about how can I use my talent, my voice, to contribute to these issues. But we're going to have to do this together, you and I. All of us in this room, all of us that this message touches, we must begin the work by agreeing to first and foremost listen. We have to listen. 
And we have to listen not with the intention to respond, but we have to listen with the intention to truly hear what the other person in front of us is saying. Because if we're listening to respond, we're dreaming up ways of how we're going to tear them down and tell them how wrong they are, rather than just give them the time that they need to be heard, to be understood, and to be loved. We need to bring love and logic and empathy back into our conversations once again. Secondly, the dangerously large gap that is growing between the ideologies of the Republican and Democratic parties. These are facts. According to the Pew Research Center, Republicans and Democrats are more divided along ideological lines and partisan acrimony is deeper and more extensive than any point in our recent history. And these trends manifest themselves in myriad ways, both in politics and in our everyday lives. And a new survey, more disturbing than ever, is showing that 10,000 adults nationwide find that these divisions are the greatest among those who are actually involved, the ones that are actually participating in the government, are so far away from each other, they're not listening to each other, that they can't get anything done. Across 10 political values that have been tracked by Pew Research between the years of 1994 and 2017, there's now an average of 36 percentage points. Think about that for a second. 36 percentage points between Democrats and Republicans. It's like when you go to New York and you get on the subway and it says, mind the gap. 36 percentage points, as opposed to in 1994, when the gap was only 15, and that's still a lot. In my personal opinion, this gap is a national security threat. It leaves the American people caught in what feels like a messy divorce. Has anyone gone through a divorce? Have their parents been divorced in the back? It's not an easy thing to do. What the Democratic and Republican Party machines are doing, they're forcing us to choose between one parent or the other. We're not allowed to have both, and you want to know why? Because one of them is always a terrible monster. Terrible monster. It always seems like it's an us versus them mentality, a stalemate with no real talk. They're not talking to each other. There's no real compromise happening in Congress, otherwise they wouldn't have a 10% approval rating. And there's no finding real solutions that are going to move us all forward. We're at a stalemate, and the only people that are suffering are the people that matter the most, the ones that gave them their power in the first place, the people. While the leaders of both major parties continue to sling mud at each other, which is then amplified, as we all know, by the media spin, the talking heads of CNN and Fox, we the people find ourselves left out in the cold. We're left out into the cold. Heightened states of fear, anger, confusion, and depression like we've never seen it before. Our bottled emotions building to a boil, palpable and needing somewhere to go, needing to be released. And before we know it, where are we? We're at each other's throats. And all on behalf of our tribal leaders, the ones that are supposed to be leading us to the promised land, to a better tomorrow, the ones that pay us lip service and tell us they're doing everything they possibly can. The truth is, our people are being ripped apart at the seams, and it's getting worse every day. Not to mention, while we are fighting amongst ourselves, what outside forces beyond our borders are lurking, just waiting, waiting to pounce, waiting to attack while our defenses are low? Now, I don't mean to sound all doom and gloom, Believe it or not, there are good people. There are really, really good people on both sides of the aisles. Even the ones that have unfortunately been called deplorables and snowflakes and libtards. 
but we continue to find ourselves divided over religion and politics because of fear, because of fear, because of our ego, and because of our righteous mind that we've allowed to take the driver's seat. One doesn't have to look much further for proof than the 2016 election. You guys were there for that, weren't you? It was a $6.5 billion circus, with the ringleaders ultimately being Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Entertaining at times as it was, we failed to notice the missing puzzle piece. The missing puzzle piece was the hundred million people that decided not to vote. They decided not to exercise their birthright to cast a vote that would decide the direction of their country. Many of them cited just being frustrated with having to pick the lesser of two evils, others feeling like the system is just plain out rigged, and others too busy holding down two and three jobs just to keep food on the table, just to keep a roof over their head. Did you know that 42% of those that were polled after the 2016 election identified as independent? 42% of our people, our brothers and sisters in this nation, feel like they don't have a voice in this government. That's a pretty sad number to me. However, on a more positive note, and I really think you're going to love these numbers, 50% of Congress was polled the other day, and members polled said that they would like to have peanut butter and jelly for lunch. And you want to know what the other 50% said? They said they want jelly and peanut butter for lunch. So if we could just get them to see the truth behind those numbers, to see that they have more in common than they do different, maybe, just maybe, there's hope for us left. And what's the solution? I know you guys are like, Ronnie, you're saying a lot to me. You've got these facts, you've got this data, you've got this passion, but what's the solution? Well, at first I actually contemplated developing a whole new political party. <laughs> but that's way too much work, to be honest with you, and really it wouldn't go anywhere. The truth is, we just really need to remind people out there, ourselves included, that the power has always been, it is today, and it always will be ours. We are the sovereign. We, all of us in this room, we are the co-creators of the reality in which we're living. And all the branches of government, they're a mere image of all of us. They derive their strengths, and I hate to tell you this, but they derive their weaknesses as well from all of us. But they also derive their power from us. We are now being emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually challenged more than we've ever been in our nation's history. We're being challenged to move beyond our comfort zones and to have the tough talks. To not avoid religion and politics at our family dinner table. Because the days of making excuses about why we can't respectfully educate one another and actually get excited about participating in our government, that's going to have to come to an end. And the only way that's going to happen is if we each do our part. We will no longer allow ourselves to be the victims of our own story. Instead, we're going to be our own superheroes. Lastly, we need to talk a little bit about the increased influence of money and large corporate donors on elections and elected officials by the way of lobbyists and other mechanisms. In 2008, Wall Street, I don't know if you guys remember this, but Wall Street was bailed out for $700 billion. 
and you'd think that perhaps the financial institutions would have learned their lesson and found a way to keep in check the greed that they so much have, but they haven't. In fact, as of this year in 2019, there's over 2,000 lobbyists on the books. They are employing 2,000 lobbyists on pay payroll to go wine and dine both members of the Republican and Democratic elected officials to seduce them for their votes. Now let me be clear. I'm not saying that corporations are bad. I'm not saying that their needs are not important. But I do take issue with the fact that these big corporations can essentially fund and underwrite political candidate candidates completely without our help or endorsement. They can be bought with political action committee money. And if they don't listen to what their endorsers say or they don't lean and show favoritism to those endorsers, they risk losing that funding and thereby risk losing the election, and most importantly to them, perhaps losing their power. However, it must be noted that it takes two to tango, and three to, well, three is company. We the people must always remember that we are the most important voice in this conversation, and it will always be that way. We've got to hold our, responsibility, our, responsi our representatives accountable for their actions and for their votes. If they're no longer protecting us and our interests, and we find that they're just paying us lip service, then in the words of Ariana Grande, thank you, next. Thank you, next. Now listen, it is not my intention. I'm not getting up here to make enemies of the leadership of either major party. It's not my goal. I am able to see as an independent mind the value of the narratives on both sides of the aisle. But I'm more readily able to see the reasons that have actually caused them to have a breakdown in the communication that we are all suffering through. The inability to respectfully communicate with one another, to simply explain our anger rather than lash out in a knee-jerk reaction, and to make decisions with the greatest good of the people in mind, it's actually paralyzing our country's ability to move forward. And the world is watching. I would argue that fixing this problem is one of the most important, if not the most, important task at hand before we move on to any other issue that we are talking about in the media. This is first and foremost. If we don't do this, nothing else matters. Ultimately, it's time to level the political playing field so that candidates of quality, good character, not perfect, strong platforms and innovative approaches from all walks of life can make their way into the political arena and that they actually have a real valid shot at a sustainable campaign. It's really unfair that a candidate that has simply more money can out-purchase another one with ads and win mainly due just because of the increased visibility, simply because an equally formidable candidate didn't have the financial fitness to compete. The American people deserve to have their voices heard with legitimate elections, a fair and balanced media that reports the news with integrity, and above all else, we deserve a safe and respectful and conducive environment in which we can share and receive information to debate our findings and the facts and to come to a common understanding making compromises for the common good and finding solutions that will not only help us to survive, not only help us to live, but for the first time to thrive. The American people deserve honesty and transparency from their leaders. We don't want to be talked to as if we're not smart enough to know what's going on behind the curtain. We know what's going on. 
We don't want to be lied to anymore. No. What we want and deserve are leaders that are more in touch with the reality that each of us face on a day-to-day -day basis. Waking up, going to work, paying bills, struggling paycheck to paycheck, raising our children, fighting diseases, dreaming of better days ahead, and navigating the toxic energy that is swirling about due to the radical hatred, the prejudice, and the breakdown in communication in Washington, D.C. We want our leaders to be truly representative of the diversity that makes up our beautiful country that also happens to be the most unique political science experiment in the world. I am deeply grateful for each of you for being here with me tonight, for celebrating our president, Abraham Lincoln, and for asking that his soul be infused into the path upon which we are about to have the courage to embark upon together. I have no illusion of grandeur. It will not be an easy road ahead. But I promise you this, that regardless of how far this journey goes, it will be worthwhile. Every truth we have the courage to share, every kindness we have the compassion to show one another, and every person that chooses to offer their time and their talent and their pocketbook with the campaign. That's what's going to make it real. That's what's going to make it tangible. And that is what will make the vision of meeting in the middle not only possible, but probable. And it's actually a beautiful reality that we could all work together and be proud of. As the late, great Albert Einstein said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. It's not about writing a Republican narrative or a Democratic narrative. Moving forward, it is about finding our common ground, and it's about writing an American narrative. With that being said, allow me to reintroduce myself to each and every one of you. My name is Ronnie Kroll, and I am officially announcing my candidacy for the office of President of the United States. I want to thank each and every one of you for spending your time tonight. And may your God bless America. Thank you very much. Woo!